Hello, everyone. My name is Larry Steckel. I'm Extension Weed Specialist with the University of Tennessee. And for the next little bit, we're going to talk about weed management in 2022 and 2023. The topics uh, to go over here, uh, very briefly, kind of go over dicamba regulation, kind of where that is and where it may go. Uh, the harbor site shortage and delay that continues to dog us. Uh, we saw it a little in 2021, sure saw it in 2022, and we're likely to see still some issues in 2023. Uh, talk about the evolution of dicamba 2,4-D resistant pigweed and how to manage those new biotypes that are uh, getting away from our oxid herbicides. And very briefly, I thought, that, thought I'd try to address glyphosate resistant Johnson grass. As far as dicamba regulation, there very well may be uh, some new regulation added in 2023. Uh, you, you hear everything and I don't know what to believe, maybe an earlier cutoff, who knows? Uh, there may not be anything at all. Um, but regardless for 2023, it will be a recertification year for pesticide applicators in the state. Of course, that's a three-year process. So last time we did it was in 2020. Now again, here in 2023, uh, we will be doing it. And of course, that'll be a three-year process. It will last to 2026. And like we did in, in, in 2020, uh, dicamba training will be part of that uh, recertification process. It'll be lumped in with uh, the gramoxone if you need that, or the paraquat training. Uh, also, just uh, other good stewardship um, and worker protection safety. Uh, you know, just kind of the fundamentals of good stewardship on pesticides will be all part of that training and uh, will be what's on tap for this next year um, that we're all going to have to get in line and do. The herbicide shortage in 2022 is likely to continue into 2023. Of course, we saw that with things like Promoxone and Liberty. Liberty in particular was very short in 2022. I think we're liable to see some issues again in 2023. I don't see this going away just anytime soon. Um, Roundup, of course, this year was, was a short in a few cases. I think eventually most folks got what they needed. And in some cases, it was maybe a little bit late arriving. That's possible again next year, but we'll see. Uh, of course, Roundup can be replaced with Select, and we had folks that, even with good Roundup supply, use Select just because we're starting to see just more and more glyphosate-resistant grass species, whether it's barnyard grass, uh, the goose grass, things like that. Uh, Select is a very good replacement uh, if Roundup can't control the grasses in your field. Um, it also can be mixed with Verdict, Clethodin can, uh, give us early broad-spectrum burn down, can be tank mixed with dicamba. You do see a little bit of antagonism on, on clethodim if it's tank mixed with dicamba, but not quite as much as you do with Roundup. And with clethodim, you can come over, overcome that with a rate. A pint of a two pound uh, will typically uh, be enough to give you good control. Unless you start seeing some bigger grasses, then you may want to go up from there. The herbicide technology mix this year, just, just my best guess estimate. Take it for what it's worth. Uh, extend soybeans, roughly 95% of the soybeans grown in the state were extend, the rest were mostly enlist. Uh, and we're again, all extend cotton. So we've been all in on the extend trades now for several years uh, here in Tennessee, really right from the start, we jumped on them pretty heavy and still leaning on hard today. So it's not a surprise that we're starting to see pigweed in particular that's adapting uh, to those new herbicides. Uh, Palmer amaranth and its close cousin water hemp um, really find a niche in a herbicide only environment if that's how you're trying to manage them. And that's how we've been trying to manage it you know, for the last 20 years. Uh, and just one herbicide after another they've overcome as far as resistant. Palmer amaranth is resistant to no less than nine different herbicide modes of action. In the state of Tennessee, it's a half dozen uh, different herbicide modes of action, most notably now dicamba and 2,4-D. Water hemp likewise is, is resistant to a lot of different herbicide modes of action. And that in particular, which has been surprising to me, has really moved in and, and found a home in Middle Tennessee, not so much West Tennessee, but Middle Tennessee. There's a lot of water hemp in Middle Tennessee. Looking at dicamba use before extend crops, uh, you might uh, just kind of give a little history here. If you look at the the big I states, Illinois and Iowa, they got roughly 20 million acres of the big row crops, corn, soybeans, wheat. Of course, they don't have much cotton uh, up there, but um, just all those row crops. And Tennessee, we've got 3 million of those particular crops. And despite having that much fewer acres in row crops, 
we use almost two times as much dicamba over the last 20 years than those states that have a lot more acres. And I think that really speaks to the selection pressure uh, we've been putting on dicamba uh, on pigweed. Of course, we were using it trying to grow after horsefoot, right, or mare's tail. And that's what we're, uh, that's what we were targeting, but we were exposing a lot of pigweed over those years to dicamba as well. And it really looks like we primed the pump to see resistance develop here first in Tennessee, but maybe some other states that have a lot more acres. So these are some of the first calls we got. This was back in 2019. Uh, and these are the fields, you know, we get called to when, when herbicides don't work. And I'll just let the video speak for itself. And you know, the, the primary herbicide trying to target this pigweed was Roundup in, in Dicamba, and it, and it walked right through it. And this is in our first rodeo. We've seen this before with Roundup. We've seen it with Flexstar. We've seen it before that with things like Pursuit and Staple. Um, just, just jailbreak level of, of pressure in some of these fields that have uh, basically one herbicide targeted, in this case, pigweed. And, uh, we started getting more calls on it. Uh, as we went in cotton, this is in West Tennessee now, though there's a middle Tennessee where we had Roundup and Dicamba and, and, and pigweed escaping uh, multiple applications in some cases. And it was going to seed and producing seed for next year pretty soon. That's the main biotype of the pigweed you got in your field is the Dicamba resistant version. And we definitely got that in Gibson, Crockett, some places in Lauderdale, and a few other counties starting to get into it. This was at Lauderdale after Roundup and Dicamba, a couple of different shots. Uh, it's a big pigweed field with some soybean in it. And that's what we're starting to see in some fields. And I'm afraid it's going to get worse uh, as, as time goes on. And folks are a little late to the party figuring out that these oxygen herbicides are no longer working on their pigweed. So Delaney Foster, she's been working on a PhD with us here. And uh, she did a great screening at a number of these locations where it looked like we were getting sketchy pigweed control. And she did a uh, timing where she went out two to four inch pigweed, six to eight, 10 to 12. And she did it here with, uh, with the one X or the labeled weight, 22 ounces of extended max, 44 and 88. Um, and you'll see at best we were getting 40% control with 22 ounces. Uh, we doubled the rate. And it helped some, but not a lot. And then we had to get up to 88 ounces in spray time to even get close to where we were a few years ago with 22 ounces. So definitely, uh, we, we've lost pigweed with, with dicamba in, this particular, in these particular fields. This is the more recent screens we've done in the greenhouse just in the last couple, actually, a couple months now, uh, back in, in April. Uh, and you can see this is one other location we screened in the greenhouse, 22 ounces of extended max, most of all the pigweed's dead, 44 ounces of extended max on a Lauderdale County population, and all of it's still alive and goes on to live, unfortunately. This was a field in, in Lauderdale County that where the pigweed got through Roundup Dicamba and then uh, got through Liberty. And we had a lot of fear that the Liberty resistant pigweed documented across the river uh, that pollen had crossed the river and gave us resistance in here in Tennessee. Uh, but fortunately, this is not a lot of good news, but this is the good news. Uh, it's just one x ray of Liberty on pigweeds from a lot of these different fields, including that one you just saw. We killed them dead as a hammer. So it looks like it was more just sprayed on a bad Liberty day, or cold, wet, or something like that, than a resistance event. Of course, thank God we, we can't afford to lose another herbicide. So you look at the amaranth species found, commonly found in Tennessee, you got Palmer amaranth, you got common water hemp, it's close cousin, and then you got a bunch of others. A lot of these you can find in middle Tennessee, spiny amaranth, probably the most numerous in the state because you can find it everywhere and it loves pastures because those big old spines and pigweeds don't wanna eat them, or pigweeds, uh, cows don't wanna eat them. Uh, but common water hemp, very, very common in middle Tennessee and Palmer in, of course, West Tennessee. And the way you tell those apart, uh, 
at best, there's, it's basically impossible. You only have hairs on the leaf, look very, very similar. The Palmer just grows bigger. And in general, it, the best way to tell them apart is in the fall, looking at the flowering branches. If you measure those flowering branches and feet, it's Palmer amaranth. If you measure them in inches, it's water amaranth. And really, that's the best way to tell them apart. This is uh, in the Cumberland River bottom uh, near Clarksville. Uh, a couple applications, it's back in 2019, we got called to this field with water hemp escape, multiple applications with dicamba. Same different, same area. Uh, to, uh, next year, same result. At the heavy rates of dicamba, still the pigweed escaped. And indeed, we did a rate study there and it looked very similar to what we saw with Palmer, where the 22 ounces rate of extended max is given about 40% control. You double the rate, but still isn't good enough. So our good folks up at Purdue uh, did some screening for us, uh, looking at increased dicamba rate with a number of populations. These the blue populations around in the triangle are from, from Indiana, but the X, the green X is from Tennessee. And you can see ours showed the best tolerance or resistance to water hemp in Tennessee to dicamba from anything they screened. And of course, everything was way less uh, sensitive to dicamba than our susceptible chair. So how resistant are they? Water hemp is about four and a half X dicamba resistant. Water hemp is still susceptible to 2,4-D. Palmer amaranth is about four X dicamba resistant and 2,4-D resistant, it's cross resistant. The water hemp isn't, 2,4-D still getting it, but with a lot, not all of them, but with most of the Palmer amaranth populations if it's dicamba resistant, we're finding 2,4-D is not effective as well. We have found a location or two where that isn't the case, but by and large, it, it is. So these are the counties where we've done all the testing. Again, the Palmer Amaranth issues are all in West Tennessee, primarily County of Waterdale, Crockett, uh, Gibson, uh, Madison. Uh, that's where we're seeing most of them, but we're still screening some in some other counties. The water hemp population is primarily Montgomery. We are seeing some in Henry and even down in Bedford. So how are we gonna manage them? Well, basically doing what we did before extending crops came online is overlapping residuals. I really don't have a pick of the litter here in soybean, a dual-based product, a peroxisulfone-based product like Authority Edge or uh, Anthem, uh, Zidua, uh, or a Metribuzin-based product. Pr frankly, I like Metribuzin stacked in with these as well. That'd give us another mode of action. And then when we spray that post application, whether it be an enlist or extend, we add a residual with it, whether it's Anthem Max, Tool, Outlook, um, what have you, we, we overlay another residual with it. Um, just don't ever let the pigweed come up. Basically, same song, second verse with, with, with uh, cotton. Again, put a good pre down, come back um, with that early post emergence application, whether it be with a dicamba extend or 2,4-D with enlist. And again, put a residual herbicide over the top. One way to put a residual herbicide over top of cotton is, um, in, is putting Zidua uh, applied via fertilizer. Uh, there was a number of farmers did this in 2021. Uh, and uh, I think there's gonna be some here in 2022 use it as well, uh, where they incorporate, where they uh, get Zidua in with the fertilized B6 to B8, provide very good pigweed and grass control. Saw no cotton injury. According to the label, it has to be applied at a fertilizer rate of 200 to 700 pounds. Most people were using around 250 pounds. Uh, a lot of pluses to this. One is it frees up a sprayer during crunch time. Uh, we know you plant bug sprays, post and soybeans. Uh, and another is just don't get any cotton burn or injury when you put it on via fertilizer. Of course, the downside is that the fertilizer prices now this all of a sudden becomes a pretty expensive carrier uh, compared to water. So the take home for 2022 going into 2023 is really have a plan B if herbicide choice A is not available. I think there's a good chance we, we could see some issues with, with herbicides for supply in 2023. The bread and butter things in pigweed control always start clean using paraquat. Overlap residual herbicides is going to be our, our main tool to try and control grasses and pigweeds. And a lot of these herbicides we were using post are no longer working, whether it's Roundup with grasses or Dicamba 24D with with pigweed, and then consider using fertilizer applied uh, via uh, uh, peroxisulfone or even pendimethalin can be applied in that fashion. And it gives you basically no injury to the cotton and good residual control. 
Last point I want to make was on the Johnson grass. We are getting more and more issues with Roundup no longer controlling Johnson grass, particularly in the southwestern counties uh, in Tennessee, like Tipton and Shelby and Lauderdale and Madison uh, Kip and, and Haywood. Um, and what we're seeing with this is, is uh, seeing viruses show up again. So some of you remember farming in the 80s and 90s, we'd remember seeing uh, stunting around Johnson grass clumps and fields, corn being stunted. Well, it's, it's done by a virus and that virus overwinters in rhizomes of Johnson grass and it's vectored from the Johnson grass to the corn uh, by a couple of different aphids. And we're again, in, in, in just recent years now, we're starting to see this injury again from these viruses. And then back in the 80s and 90s, seed companies should sell hybrids that had virus resistance. Um, they need to dust those germplasm off and get them out again with uh, Roundup not working like it once did on Johnson grass. This is what it looks like, uh, the virus on corn. I hadn't seen this in 20 years, but lo and behold, here we got it again. Uh, Johnson grass patch was just over here, but it just, they stunt, they get real short, they color up, and usually those corn ears, those corn plants will not produce. Here. So that's that's the take home. I hope you picked up a piece of, some information here or there that might be of use to the farm and have a great upcoming harvest season. Hope everybody has a profitable safe one.